Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Club W presentation, Stop the Leak. Uh, th this presentation will be recorded and will start momentarily. While you're waiting, here are just a few things to keep in mind. You are muted, but are welcome to enter any questions in the chat or Q&A as you think of the questions. However, uh, Sue will wait to the end of the presentation to address them. And I will go over it again at the tail end, but um, if you have questions that we don't get to, you're welcome to just email those to me. And I am Dottie Hines, and my email address is D-O-T-T-I-E dot H-I-N-E-S at N-K-C-H dot org. And I think now we're going to uh, head over to Sue. Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a good day. It's good to see the sun today. Um, I'm excited to share with you some of the information that I've learned over the years. So let's get started. Um, let me start. Let me see if I can get things moving. Um, I am a physical therapist. I graduated in 1990 from um, the University of Kansas's physical therapy program. I have been a physical therapist now for almost 31 years and 24 of those years, I have focused specifically on pelvic floor issues, um, learning evaluation and treatment strategies. I've also been in the rehab management world for 27 of those years. Most recently, I've been with North Kansas City Hospital since 2017. So today, my goal is to help you understand what incontinence is, understand how the incidence is for people and the impact it can have. I want to teach you a little bit about how the pelvic floor muscle works, provide you with treatment information, and hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll have some takeaways learning how you can regain control of this issue. So let's talk about incontinence. It's, it's the involuntary loss of urine. We certainly don't want to pee our pants is what we'd want to think about. So when we think about incontinence, we first have to start and talk about the types of incontinence. So I've listed those here, which include stress, urge, a mixture of both of those, overflow, where your bladder is not getting fully empty, and functional incontinence. So maybe a physical impairment such as arthritis or some other disability limits your ability to get to the bathroom timely. The most common types of incontinence, however, are stress and urge or a combination of those. And I'll take just a few minutes to describe that. So when we think of stress incontinence, this is when you cough or sneeze or laugh so hard that you thought you were gonna pee your pants or maybe you did. So what's happening here is that we have a downward pressure. So if you put your hands on your stomach area and you cough or you sneeze, you're gonna feel that diaphragm push down. And what has to happen is that the pelvic floor, which is underneath, has to be able to contract up and give either an equal or stronger force upward to stop this downward force that's coming from above. So we think of this probably being a weakness of the muscle issue but also probably a timing issue where this happens and this isn't happening at the exact time that it needs to occur and then you have leakage. So we can focus on strengthening of those muscles, we can focus on timing of those muscles. Urge incontinence, I call that more of the key in the door type of thing. So here we've got a capacity problem. So our bladder should hold, should, hold about two cups of fluid. Um, but sometimes we teach ourselves to go just to go. For instance, I just went to the bathroom. I'm getting ready to go on a long car trip. Everybody's in the car and I think, oh, I better go to the bathroom just one more time. I probably don't have two cups of fluid because I just went five minutes ago. So I've taught my body because I'm kind of nervous and I'm kind of anxious to go just to go. Um, we also think of this when you're in the car and you're driving and you see a sign and it says 50 miles um, before the next gas station. Sometimes we can say, I got it. And sometimes we're not able to do that. So when we think of urge incontinence, it's kind of that mental game that kind of goes on. Um, another time I think of that is that 
I leave, I go to the bathroom before I leave work, I get home and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, here it comes. I'm in that environment that kind of makes me calm down. Um, and so again, it could be a weakness issue. It could be other issues influencing it like running water, um, seeing your friends get in line for the bathroom, something like that. A lot of times I see that the people I've treated have a little bit of stress incontinence and urge incontinence, a little bit of both. So when we think about the incidence, it is definitely more common in women than men. Um, and it starts to become more of an issue as we hit or approach menopause. And the reason that that has, is important to understand is that as we approach menopause, our bodies are starting to lose the estrogen that's in our muscles and in our tissues. So if you take maybe your um, pictures when you were in your 20s and hold them up to your um, face now in your 50s and 60s, you may go, what happened? You know, everything's kind of droopy now. I've got this double chin thing going on. What's happening? Well, we don't have as much estrogen in our tissues, so everything isn't nice and tight. Um, and that's what's going on in the pelvic muscle as well. It doesn't have as much estrogen to kind of help influence the tightness of the pelvic floor. So it definitely becomes more of an issue. I'm going to show you on some drawings here in a little bit why it's more common in, in females than males. But again, it still can be an issue for men as well. As far as the cost, um, you'll see on the screen I put $50 to $1,000 a year. I think this is actually a very low amount. Um, I think this is more just the amount for absorbent products. Um, I've read that sometimes people just choose to use paper towels wadded up because it's cheaper than buying some absorbent products. Some people use a combination of an absorbent pad plus some paper towels. So whatever your strategy is, um, we respect that, but that can become very costly over time. And then if you add medications to this, maybe a surgery to this, maybe you have to go to a nursing home because it's too hard to live alone any longer, um, that cost is just gonna keep going up. So let's talk about anatomy. I think it makes a lot more sense when you understand how we're set up to understand the function of it. So if you look at this top um, left picture, this is if I was to take my top off and I was to look down into your pelvis. The pelvis has this layer of muscles that totally fill that cavity down below there. So that's kind of like the basement of your house. It's the basement of your body's house. And if you look at this lower left picture, I've got my pointer on the pubic bone. So if you reach down in front and push on something down near your pubis, you feel something kind of hard. That is the pubic bone. And then it goes all the way back to the tailbone. If you can see my pointer, again, I'm on the lower left picture. So this shadow that has arrows calling it the pelvic floor muscle is like a hammock between two trees. And we, that hammock is all that pelvic floor muscle up above here that's filling that cavity. So when we think about the pelvic floor muscles, we think of three functions. Um, they support the organs that are above them. So down in this lower left, I have a bladder, I've got a uterus, may or may not still be there depending on your situation, and I have the rectum. And these organs are held from up above with some ligaments. So we've got some support up here, but the pelvic floor is underneath kind of giving it another basement support, okay? The next thing is sphincter. Um, if you look at this, I'm, I'm back on this lower left picture. I've got my bladder, I've got a tube here, Next to it, I've got another tube there, and over here, I've got another tube here. So those have, have openings to the outside. So that pelvic floor muscle helps to close those openings and keep those openings closed. And finally, um, one of the functions is sexual. So if you decide after this presentation that you'd like to have your partner get involved with you to strengthen your muscles, that's what they do. That's part of their function. Now, certainly as we age or maybe we lose a partner, 
that ability to use that muscle sexually may decrease. And some people will say, well, you know, my pelvic floor muscles, they have really been taxed because I've had five or six kids. And my comment to them is, I, I don't think it's the kids because when you had your children and you gave birth, probably within a month or two, you got that pelvic floor function back. You weren't having leakage. You weren't having incontinence. Everything went back. So you can't really blame it on those kids you had 20 years ago because that pelvic floor healed from that surgery. That's what we're designed to do. However, um, I will say with the five kids or however many kids, um, you probably are tired when you go to bed at night. And so the idea of sexual activity may not be as appealing um, and you get woke up throughout the night. So there really just isn't those intimate opportunities that you have maybe before kids to keep that muscle strong. So it can be a variety of things. Women that have never had children have incontinence issues and pelvic floor weakness. So we're not blaming it on kids. Um, and certainly I'll give you strategies throughout this presentation that are not sexual in nature that can help the function of the pelvic floor. So the question, why, why did women get this um, gift of incontinence more than men? So I have two pictures here. If you can see my pointer, whoops, let me go back. All right, so down on the, on the left-hand side, I am pointing to the bladder of the female. And it's very difficult, it's kind of faint on this picture, but where my pointer is underneath the bladder is the urethra. Everybody hold up a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up. That length of the urethra on a woman is the length of a thumb, about, about that long. So if you think about it, if the bladder's up here, and this is only how long it is, not very long before urine's gonna escape if you have to cough or sneeze. So if I walk over here to the man, I'm on the right picture now. I've got my pointer at the bladder of the male. And then this long tube here that I'm tracing down through the penis is the urethra of the man. So look how long that is. Wow, that's about the length of a long drinking straw that you get at Sonic or something like that. And then it's kind of faint, but up around here at the neck of the bladder is the prostate gland. So if a man should cough, um, first of all, the prostate gland acts like a little rubber band at the neck of the bladder. So it kind of helps. And then if there was a cough or a sneeze, um, maybe a little fluid gets down into the urethra, but, but it's got a lot, it's gonna take quite a bit of fluid before anything's gonna creep out. So that is really, I think, the number one reason. It's our anatomy, it's how we're built. And so we've got more stuff up here pushing on that pelvic floor. We've got, we use our pelvic floor in different ways to give birth and things of that nature. Men often do become incontinent if they have a prostate surgery and the prostate gland is taken away. Um, another indication that you might wanna be aware of for um, men is that if you start to have a man that's going to the bathroom frequently, you know, they go and then five minutes later, they feel like they've got to go again. And I think there's a commercial like that. Um, that might be an indication that their prostate gland has become enlarged and maybe is not allowing the bladder to get empty. And so it kind of squeezes off. So that's a good indication to encourage them to get in to see their doctor to see if their prostate gland has enlarged or if there's any problems with it. Um, men can learn to do pelvic exercises just like women. We'll talk about that in a minute, but again, the incontinence issue has a lot more to do with anatomy. The other part I enjoy talking about with patients is how the nervous system influences the pelvic floor. So the nervous system in the pelvic floor has two components. You have your voluntary component, you have your involuntary component. So if everybody opens and closes their hand, like I'm doing, I'm telling my hand to open and close. That's voluntary. It's just not doing that uncontrollably. So the pelvic floor has some voluntary innervation to those muscles, which allow you to do what's called a Kegel, where you can contract the pelvic floor and let it go. Contract the pelvic floor, let it go. 
So that's why a physical therapist or an occupational therapist can teach you to get that pelvic floor stronger because we work with muscles. The other component is the involuntary component. So with this, um, involuntary control happens in organs like your heart, your lungs, your stomach. So I don't tell my heart to beat 72 beats a minute. I don't sit there and say beat, beat, beat. It just happens. Um, same with the lungs doing their part, the stomach digesting. And the pelvic floor has some involuntary control as well. And if you, if you didn't have any of that happening, you would just pour out. So as soon as fluid hit the bladder, it would just go. But we know there's some involuntary control. And the way we know that is think about urge. You get this um, urge to go to the bathroom. So what happens is the bladder starts to fill. There's a message that goes up through the sympathetic nervous system to your brain and it says, Sue, you might wanna think about going to the bathroom. And I'm in this presentation with all of you. I can't stop and go to the bathroom. So I say, mm, not right now. And that urge goes away. And that'll keep happening until I decide, okay, I've got to give in, no more, I've got to go to the bathroom. That's what you do if you're on a car trip. You see, you look for when's the next exit. Oh, it's 30 minutes, 30 miles away, that next gas station. And you say to yourself, I can do it, I can make it. And usually you do. And you might even get to the gas station and say, Gosh, I thought I had to go, but I don't. I don't think that happens too often. But my point is, is that this urge comes, you say yes or no, if you say no, it goes away. And so that is involuntary control through the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And it, and it works a little with your brain somewhat. So we'll talk about how to manage that as we go along. So how do we treat incontinence? So we have three main ways. I'm gonna go very briefly into the top two, surgery and medications, and then I'll talk a little more about rehab therapy because that's where I come in. So with surgery, um, again, we think of things like your sling or your meshes. Um, and what they're doing in most of these cases is that they're taking tissue, could be animal, it could be an artificial mesh based, and they're wrapping it around that neck of the urethra to kind of give it a help. Um, I'm not a surgeon, so I've, I've not witnessed exactly what all they do, but, but that is a common surgery. Years ago, there were some, several issues related to having um, the mesh, and there was too much, and there was women that developed some pelvic pain issues from that. I have seen some of those women personally. Um, it's very um, disabling, but again, most of that has been resolved. My understanding in talking to um, an OBGYN one time about that was that some of the kits maybe had too much mesh in them and that was part of the problem. Um, there are other surgeries involving, you know, kind of pulling up um, and that involves our prolapse or cystocele. Um, on the second one, the nerve stimulators, sometimes back to that nervous system I was talking about, they can actually put electrodes into the nervous system that kind of you have an implanted stimulator that affects that messaging going to the brain and, and kind of dampens it down a little bit. Um, the final one is a prolapse. Some people call it a cystocele. And the way people describe this when they have a prolapse is that it feels like I've got a ball between my legs. So you could start the day, everything's fine, but by the end of the day, they say something's down there, something's rubbing, something feels like it's falling out. And that generally is a prolapse. Some people have those happen over time. Some people will have it happen instantly. Um, I've had a patient in the past that had it happen during childbirth. I've, I've known patients that it had it happen during um, intercourse. Um, when you have a prolapse, especially if it's to the point that you feel that ball between your legs, I definitely would recommend that you get in to see your doctor, probably need some type of surgical intervention if you're a surgical candidate. Um, and what's happened, if you can see these um, pictures down below, is that it could be the bladder, it could be the uterus, or it could be the rectum dropping into that vaginal canal. And when I 
describe it to people, I put, put my finger like this and I say, it's kind of like this little grape coming out to see me. And that's what a prolapse looks like. You can have a grade one, which is pretty mild. We probably all have a little bit of a grade one. Grade two is a little bit worse, but certainly when it gets to grade three, that's pretty severe. Um, with a prolapse, we can non-surgically manage it with a device called a pessary. Pessaries, I would describe them looking kind of like a teething ring, and they are fit to you and your anatomy in your doctor's office. And basically, they put them up through the vaginal canal, and it's kind of like a bra for the bladder, bra for the uterus. It kind of holds everything up. And this is a great option for people who are not surgical candidates. Maybe they're gonna have more kids, so they wanna wait to do the, the surgery until after they're done having children. So they'll use a pessary until they get there. Pessaries can come in and out. They can be taken out in and out daily to clean. You can still go to the bathroom with a pessary in. You can still have intercourse with the pessary in. Um, women that have a hard time manipulating it in and out, um, can actually have it inserted and then they can go to their doctor's office to have it taken out and cleaned and put back in. So they can stay in for a period of time if they don't have the capability of getting it in and out. Um, but that is something that the doctor would do. The other option that people will look for is medications. Um, a lot of common meds are your Detrol, your Ditropan, Vesicare, you've heard those um, name brands. Um, and what these are doing is they're back to, we're back on that nervous system and we're back on talking to those signals I was telling you about that tell the brain, Sue needs to go to the bathroom. And Sue's like, I don't wanna go to the bathroom. I've got this presentation to do. And, and these can be very effective, um, but they have side effects. They oftentimes, the patients will talk about having a dry mouth, um, dry eyes, which can kind of blur your vision. They may have some constipation issues with it, may give them a little bit of a cognitive fog. And then some people just get tired of taking a pill. Um, so there are options and I'm not saying they're bad. Sometimes they work just well for people and they just take that edge off. Um, another option, back to estrogen, we talked about that our estrogen in our muscles is going away. So there are creams that you can put right on the vaginal pelvic floor muscle region that kind of help to give it a little more stability in that. There's Botox. I've seen Botox. Um, doctors put Botox into the urethra to kind of bulk it up so that urine isn't escaping as easily. And again, all are options um, that are pretty non-invasive, but again, there could be side effects. Um, so it just depends on the situation and maybe your medical history as well. So this is where I probably have more of my understanding is to teach you what rehab therapy does. Um, we're not a quick fix. I'll just start by that. Um, it is definitely the, the most conservative approach, and it would be the approach I would encourage people to try first before they go to medicines or go to surgery, unless, of course, it's a prolapse. We usually say, give us six to eight weeks, and I always say, it didn't come on overnight. It's not going to go away overnight, so let me work with you to kind of help you through this. Um, you want to make sure that you're seeing someone that's been trained. Um, all of us go to school for our degrees, but I can tell you for sure, none of us walk out of school with um, the ability to do pelvic floor exercises. We definitely have to go through more training, maybe work with some mentoring clinicians. Um, it's a very personal area. So when I say training, when we get trained, we're actually learning how to do evaluations on each other. And we have instructors teaching us what we're looking at, what we're looking for. And so you definitely wanna to get to somebody that has had some training in pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, it could be an OT, some practices use OTs, some use PTs, some a combination. And at our facility, our OTs are primary to pelvic floor therapy, but certainly because of my PT background, I will jump in and help as well. 
Um, when we do an evaluation, we're going to ask you a lot of questions. And we do that because we're trying to tease out multiple things like, is this more of a stress issue? Is it more of an urge issue? Um, what types of things are you drinking every day? Um, what's your typical routine every day? How many pads every day do you use? You know, how severe is it? So we ask a lot of personal questions. We may ask, are you sexually active? Um, because we know if you're not sexually active, you don't have one of the ways that helps to strengthen the pelvic floor. We will do an external exam. So I don't have anybody in a stirrup um, so to speak, and I don't, I always say I don't have any kind of metal monster to open your cervix. I don't use anything like that. I have gloves, I have a, my single finger and some lubrication, and we go very gently and very carefully. We're going to watch and you use the muscle because there's that voluntary control. We're also going to watch some of that involuntary control. We're going to say cough for me, and we're going to watch what the pelvic floor does. Does it push out? Does it just stay flat or does it come up? Um, and you could put a mirror down below and see that same um, information. Um, you might not know what you're looking for, but that's what we're trained in doing. We're also gonna look at other things like any scarring. I like to look at C-section scars or any abdominal scars because sometimes those scars can create adhesions internally. And so that ability for that bladder to fill is not as good. And so we have to work some of those scars and get those softened up. Um, most of the patients we see, many of you probably have heard of a Kegel or a pelvic floor contraction, um, but maybe aren't doing it quite right. So we're gonna look at your form and your technique. We're gonna talk about your behavior and your lifestyle. Biofeedback is one term you'll hear a lot, and some therapists that use biofeedback swear by it, and others don't. I'm not a huge fan of biofeedback. I do think it has its place. I love using it with pelvic pain issues that aren't resolving. But again, that really comes down to clinician preference and their skill background. So one size does not fit all with pelvic floor treatment, um, but the approaches are pretty similar by most therapists. So I wanna just briefly touch upon Kegels. You may say, why are they called Kegels? Well, Dr. Arnold Kegel was a gynecologist that invented a device called a pyrometer, and that is what measured the contraction of the pelvic floor. So somehow that name stuck, and we oftentimes, when we talk about pelvic floor exercises, we talk about a Kegel. Um, it is a voluntary contraction, so back to my muscle control, I'm teaching you how to use that muscle. I want to know how strong it is. I want to know how long you can hold it um, and sustain that contraction. And we can teach women and men how to do pelvic floor contractions. Um, the one thing I will tell people is that you, sh you should, I could be doing a pelvic floor exercise right now and you should not know I'm doing it. So if you're bouncing up and down or something's moving of that nature, you're overdoing it. You are actually probably using some auxiliary muscles or accessory muscles and you're really doing too much. You're not isolating just that small muscle. So the best technique I always say is um, think about your anal opening and try to con contract or squeeze it off. Um, again, nobody should know I'm doing it. So if you're doing a full butt squeeze, too much, just, just the anal opening. Um, you could try the stop the flow of urine test the next time you go to the bathroom. But I always say this is just a test. It is not the exercise. If you're struggling with figuring out the exercise, a great way to do it is go to the bathroom and try to stop the flow of urine, but don't make that the exercise or you will develop a retention issue. Our goal usually is that you can hold that contraction about 10 seconds. You can do it 10 times and you're gonna do about 30 a day. And I recommend you try to spread them out. I don't want you to do all 30 at once, number one, because your muscles will fatigue very fast and you'll start to compensate. And number two, you just need to get stronger over the course of the day. So sometimes I will tell people, okay, every time a commercial comes on, do a couple. Every time you're standing in line, do a couple. Every time you're at a stoplight, do a couple. And if you're really weak and you can't hold for 10 seconds, then we're gonna start small and gradually build you up. 
just like we would if, if you couldn't lift a weight in your arm, we're gonna just have you use the weight of your arm and gradually build you up. Um, there are also quick contractions that we can teach you. Sometimes those help to kind of calm that nervous system down. And then for that coordination component, that cough or sneeze, I will sometimes say, okay, the next time you know you're gonna cough, I want you to contract and then cough. The next time you're gonna lift that laundry basket, I want you to contract and then lift. If you always leak every time you go from sit to stand, then the next time you get up from a chair, I want you to contract and then stand up because your timing has obviously gotten off. So you could be really strong, but your timing's not good. So we wanna help with that. There's other ways besides pelvic floor exercises that really do help. Walking is one of the best things you can do. Um, I love using the bridge. So I've got my pointer on this gentleman who's laying on the floor and he's lifting his hips up. Um, this is a great exercise. It kind of brings in those butt muscles a little bit more than I, I need to, but sometimes I like to use this with kids with, that have bedwetting issues. Um, if I go in this lower left corner, if you remember Suzanne Summers, she had the thigh master years ago in the 70s. Well, we could get like kind of a squishy rubber ball put it between our knees and squeeze and hold 10 seconds. That is gonna go, those muscles that are on those inner thighs connect up to the pelvic floor region and they can get stronger as well. So that's a great exercise. The next one is this gentleman with the elastic band around his legs. I like a really strong band for this one. I wrap it around, I have them roll their legs out and back together. And there again, we will see on biofeedback that the pelvic muscles exercise with that activity. Some people as they age or have a disability of some sort have a hard time walking. So I like just any kind of leg chair based exercises like marching and knee kicks. Those are all good for pelvic floor exercises. And finally, anytime I'm doing an exercise or lifting something, it's a great way to say, okay, every time I lift that barbell up and do an arm curl, I'm gonna contract my pelvic floor at the same time. And you're kind of helping two exercises or two muscles at the same time. So there's lots of ways to incorporate. We like to talk about behavior and lifestyle modifications and let's talk about some norms. So it's normal to go to the bathroom every three to five hours. So do a, do a bat or check, self check on yourself. Are you going every hour? Then you've got a pelvic floor dysfunction. And it could be that it's the nervous system and it could be weakness or it could be both. So sometimes we teach ourselves how to hold and sometimes we need to reteach ourselves. So um, I like to use the story with my patients of dieting. If I diet and I shrink my stomach down, that's a good thing because the next time that the breakfast buffets reopen after COVID, um, I won't take and make two or three trips to the buffet. I may make one trip and go, gosh, I'm full. I don't want any more. I'd love to eat more, but I'm too full. So that's great for the stomach. But with the bladder, if you shrink it because you go every time you get this signal to go, your bladder is what there is going to be called a pea bladder or a pea shaped bladder. You're not going to have capacity. That two cup capacity just went down to a half a cup. So we really want to build capacity and make sure that you can hold. So sometimes it's positive thinking. It's definitely not rushing. It's, it's avoiding the, I'm gonna go just to go. I'm, I gotta get out of that mindset. Um, and then the other thing that sometimes people don't realize is the bladder is um, round in shape, but it, it will misform over time. So if I have my hand here and I've got a little pocket here, some urine can hit in that pocket. And so one of the strategies I teach women is I want you to, when you're done, go into the bathroom is wipe, stand up, and then sit back down and see if you have to go anymore. Because if there was urine in that pocket, it came into the center and you voided completely. So you got the bladder all the way empty. And that may take a, about one more minute of time um, when you go to the bathroom, 
but it saves you from having to go back 10 minutes later because you're like, I think I need to go again. I don't, I don't know why I just went. So we want you to, to empty completely. When it comes to fluids, um, some people, when they start to have leakage issues, they stop drinking um, fluids. And that's not what we want. Your bladder needs to be flushed out daily. Um, I always say if by noon every day your, your urine is still a dark yellow and maybe has a little odor to it, that's a signal to you that you're not drinking enough. So you need to drink more. Water is our best friend um, for drinking. We can drink other things like milk. We can even drink some coffee, um, but we just have to have a combination of fluids for that. One of the things that I talk to women about who get up a lot at night to go to the bathroom is when do you stop drinking during the day? So if you, for instance, um, have your evening meal around six or seven o'clock at night, that should be when you have your last main drink, whatever it may be. That gives you three to four hours till say 10 o'clock before you go to bed to kind of empty that bladder and get it all the way empty so you're not getting up in the middle of the night. If you need to take a sip of water for some meds, that's okay, but don't keep a glass of water by your bedside necessarily. Um, and just realize that if you do drink into the evening, maybe you're out with friends and, or you know just enjoying something, a hot cup of cocoa or something like that, you might have to go to the bathroom at night. So those are strategies. But again, back to training, sometimes we trained ourselves to get up. If you had a child and they always woke up at two and they needed to be fed, chances are you fed them. And then, oh, I'm up, I might as well go to the bathroom. Well, pretty soon the child started sleeping through the night, but you were always still getting up at two to go to the bathroom because you taught your bladder that that's what you're gonna do. So sometimes we've gotta untrain some of those strategies with you. Um, there are fluids that are bladder irritants. Coffee, caffeinated coffee is one. Um, carbonated beverages. You might drink a Sprite or a 7-Up that doesn't have caffeine in it, but the carbonation can be an irritant. Alcohol, um, acidic juices like orange juice are very acidic and can be irritants to the bladder. Some spicy foods and some tomato-based products. So when somebody comes in to see me and they say, oh, I drink about six cups of coffee a day. I don't tell them to stop cold turkey. Um, I think that would be very unenjoyable in life. I like my coffee too, but I might say, let's try to cut that in half. Let's, instead of drinking six, let's get you down to three. And maybe you can drink a, a glass of water in between each cup of coffee and chances are you won't drink maybe as much. Um, and if it's just that you like that warm fluid, maybe we can switch to a, a decaf or maybe a tea or something like that that doesn't have caffeine in it. So you kind of have to understand their motivation and, and what they enjoy. But, but stopping cold turkey isn't usually a fan for anybody. But most of the time they come back and they'll say, you know, that made a big difference. And I'm like, I know, I, I told you it might. So. The other thing is, back to the nervous system, we'll talk about, you know, the fact that, you know, I always say, I'm a type A person. I like things at a set time, at a set schedule. I really, I like that control factor. So a lot of people that have incontinence, not all, but a lot, are very type A kind of people. They're high drive. They've got stuff to get done and they don't have time for this. And if I just said to that person, don't go to the bathroom as much, they're going to be like, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I don't know how to do it. But then if you talk to them in their language, I might say, let's, let's look at your bladder diary. Um, looks like you can go for two hours sometimes during the day before you go to the bathroom. Let's set a goal. You can go every two hours. I'm going to give you permission, but at every two hour increment, you're going to go to the bathroom. Pretty soon, we're going to grow that time out to two and a half and then maybe to three, and we're just gonna gradually set goals to get them to a more normal bladder schedule. And at the same time, we're strengthening that, that muscle. So there's kind of a couple things going on, but that usually can be very successful for people. And it's a lot better than saying, just don't go as much. Um, it helps that way. So um, some of you that signed up may have gotten this questionnaire. If not, no worries. Um, we've got future programs coming, but 
this questionnaire is kind of designed to say, if you've got a yes or you check some of these boxes on this screening tool, you may be a candidate for our pelvic floor therapy um, here at North Kansas City. So please consider this um, and you can look through this as time goes on. So now what? In order to come and see a physical therapist or an occupational therapist, um, we require a doctor's order and that helps you because then they make sure that there's not something else going on. Also, that's what insurance is required for them to cover it. And it usually is a covered service because we're dealing with a muscle and you've got a muscle that's not working for you. So the one thing I will say is some doctors, not all, but some don't ask you these questions. They don't say, so are you having any leakage? You know, do you have any incontinence? They may not ask that question. And so if, you, if they don't ask and you forget to tell them, then it just doesn't get addressed. So if it is an issue, write it down and make a note for what you wanna to talk to your doctor about. They can give you an order. You do not have to go to a specialist. You can get an order from your primary care doctor. Um, I have gotten orders from primary care. I've gotten, I think OBGYN doctors are very focused on this topic. So they're very good about referrals. I haven't seen as many from a urologist, but that's not to say they don't refer. I just haven't seen as many personally. So we definitely are here to help you and the information is on the screen. Again, this program is being recorded. So if you're not having time to write this information down, please do. We really want you to take control. It is not a factor of just getting older. It's a factor that we're kind of just letting it happen and we really want you to take control of it. So um, we will be doing a, two more presentations regarding the pelvic floor. In February, we're gonna be talking a little more about pelvic pain related issues. And again, I'm gonna talk about it more from the muscle standpoint, um, but we'll, we'll touch on some issues with that. And then in March, we're gonna talk about um, how the gut works and how that affects pelvic floor function because pooping is good for us. So with that, I'm gonna open it to Dottie um, so that she can start giving me some questions. Okay, Sue, we have three different questions. Um, if you would like to go ahead and submit a question, you can go ahead and do that now if you'd like to. Our first question is, should you lose weight before having a cystocell, did I say that correctly? Cystocell, yeah. Uh, Rectocell. Correct. Surgery if you're overweight. If you don't lose the weight first and have the surgery, is the cystocell, rectocell more likely to come back? Okay, good question. I would go back to um, I, losing weight because that extra um, weight on top of the pelvic floor is certainly not helping anything, but I would say that I'm gonna go back to, okay, we've got this downward pressure from the weight but that pelvic floor muscle underneath is what is weak. So I would go ahead and have the cystocele or rectocele procedure. And then as soon as your doctor says you're cleared to start working on the muscle, and they may want you to wait about six weeks because they want to make sure there's healing in place, then by all means, we want to work on that pelvic floor muscle to start making it stronger. We can try to start making it stronger even before you have the surgery. Um, so if you are put off to have the surgery a month or two away, we can still have you come in, teach you exercises, start kind of prehab, so to speak, and then we can see you when it's safe after. But I would say you don't have to necessarily get the weight off before, but it's certainly gonna help when you can do both. Okay, next question. Is physical therapy cost covered by Medicare? Yes, yes. Um, so this, it is covered by Medicare. Um, you, it will depend on your plan. Some people just have Medicare Part B. So usually Medicare picks up 80% and then 20% and they have cert a certain charge factor. So there may be a 20% that comes out of pocket or a copay. So if you have a secondary insurance to Medicare, that might pick up the secondary part of that. So, but it is a covered service um, by Medicare and most insurances, yes. Okay, next question. Uh, does weight, high BMI, or fat in abdomen affect bladder leakage? 
Yes, um, it does. So all of those factors, you've got more pressure from above if you're heavy or have a high BMI. If, you're, if you've got a large abdomen, you're pushing, that's pushing down and that underneath it is the bladder. And so that pelvic floor has to work a lot harder in order to stop leakage. And like I said, this is as far, this thumb is as far as you've got between bladder and the outside world. So we definitely want to lose weight um, as another component to bladder control. Okay. Um, I am fine until I pull into the garage and then I can barely make it to the bathroom in time. You talked about that a little bit and I also have trouble with that. Okay. So, Part of what my theory on that is, is that when you pull into the garage, all of a sudden you've been holding it maybe the whole time at the grocery store. You get into the garage and you're kind of in your letdown zone where things you can kind of go, <sighs> and actually pelvic floor um, voiding when you go to the bathroom is actually that sympathetic nervous system relaxing and what it's doing is it's relaxing before you're in the right position. Same thing happens when you think I've got to go to the bathroom and you start walking towards the bathroom and you're trying to get your pants kind of down and get ready and everything's starting to happen and you're not over the toilet yet. So it's our sympathetic nervous system that we kind of have um, it's become kind of confused. We call it an angry bladder. And so we've got to kind of retrain it a little bit. It's control. It's thinking positive. Um, it's probably some weakness issue as well. So it, it can be a, a multitude of things, but I really think that pulling into the garage and, and whatnot, you're in an area where if you were to lose control, you're, you know you're kind of safe um, and so we probably just have to work a little bit on the weakness, the timing, and, and, and probably just setting some goals and, and kind of teaching your head not to let go yet, if that makes sense. Okay, I think that's it. Oh, I beg your pardon, one more. Do the insertable computer control bullets work and uses a phone app to control? What is that again? Do the insertable computer controlled bullets work? Okay. And I don't know that I'm familiar. The to control, excuse me. Okay. okay. It sounds like, I don't know if those are some type of electrical stimulation that maybe is connected. Um, I haven't seen those personally, so I don't have a lot of expertise on that. It sounds kind of like a vaginal weight um, almost. And I think that again, those are things that you can use um, to kind of increase the strength or increase the control. I would think that the phone app maybe is, is talking to those bullets and maybe, I don't know if they're giving you a stimulation. I'll have to look into that a little more, but I think anything to help you um, activate those muscles um, is going to be helpful as long as you understand how to use it, you understand the muscles that we're using and how to hold those. I'm sorry, okay, I think that's it, Sue. Okay. A couple of uh, really nice comments. Uh, that was fantastic. I'm a nurse and really appreciate all the objective information. You are a great presenter. And, Thank you. Uh, so I think it all is well, fantastic job. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again on February 18th, if not before. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.